1931, the French cavalry came up with a new system of organization for the units. It was going to have three types of vehicle. The lightest was the AMR, the Automitrailleuse de Reconnaissance. And this was a very simple, light, armored vehicle designed to sneak and peek and just find out where the enemy were. The next vehicle in the series was the AMD, the Automitrailleuse de Découverte. And what this would do was to identify what it was that the AMRs had discovered with the understanding that they might actually have to get into a bit of a firefight to do so. The third vehicle was the Automitrailleuse de Combat. This was the heavy fighting vehicle of the cavalry units. Now the divisions, the DLM and the DLC, were given the traditional cavalry roles of reconnaissance and security duties. However, although the primary fighting force of the French army was still going to be the infantry division, the AMC had to be capable of full-on fighting. The requirements that were drawn up in 1934 was an average speed of 30 kilometers an hour, about four centimeters of armor, a 47 millimeter gun, and about a 200 mile range. Now in a situation kind of similar to that which prevailed in the US at the time, because as the main fighting force, only the infantry were allowed to have tanks, the French cavalry had come up with some other name, hence the AMC. But in reality, what the French cavalry really wanted, no matter what they called it, was a tank. The contract was given to the Société d'Utilage Mécanique et du Cinege d'Artillerie, which was a subsidiary of Schneider. Now this is something of a mouthful to say quickly, even if you have a vague understanding of French, but like I do. And so what the solution was, was to simply shorten it down to an acronym, and from evermore there on, the tank was known as the Sombois. The order for the prototype was given in 1934, it was delivered in 1935, April. This is only a six month lead time. And the reason it was so quick was there's actually very little new about this tank. All the technologies and pieces had already been developed. The only new item was the engine, which they simply purchased on the open market. Before the trials of the prototype had been completed, the prototype being the AC-3, in late 1935, the order for the first production batch was made. This gives you the other name of the tank, the S-35. However, because the trials hadn't yet been finished and there were still design tweaks to be made, the first 50 vehicles off the production line were actually different to the remainder. There was a requirement for 600 tanks, but these things were very expensive to make, and only 300 were originally authorized. So here we are again in Samur, and we're in front of what is one of the later model S35s. The tank is large for the era, although relatively small compared to the tanks that would come along only a couple of years later. It consists of four cast segments, an upper front, an upper rear, and a two-piece lower hull, all of which are bolted together. Components on the front, well, you got the service light on the right-hand side. Uh, the Sawmore plate was actually a matter of pride for the crewmen. Uh, the ones that had been sent to Africa, who converted to Shermans a little bit later, uh, they took the plates off their S35s and mounted them onto their Shermans. Two positions, one for the radio operator, one for the driver, driver on the left. The radio operator you'll see has very little vision and even less ability to contribute anything to the fight. Uh, in theory, I guess, if he was feeling particularly brave, he could open up the visor a bit and discharge his personal weapon. The armor is a reasonable 45 millimeters thick and as you can see fairly well sloped at least until you get to the driver's visors. Coming a little bit further on down of course we have the two tow clevises, a shrouded headlight for night driving, the siren and the marker light on the left. The running gear is protected by these armored skirts. They're about a centimeter thick. They're hinged at the top so you undo the bolts and lift it up for maintenance. If you look at a photograph of what is underneath here, you're going to see something extremely similar to the Czech LTVZ35. 
And the reason for this is that Schneider and Skoda actually worked together to create the tanks. Uh, thus, in addition to the running gear, the gearbox on the Sommoir is very similar as well. It consists of two large bogies, each of which has two sub bogies with four wheels, and they are mounted on leaf springs. There is a ninth wheel on each side. It's a training wheel at the back that's mounted on an individual coil spring. You'll find halfway down on the side a little hatch. This is an oil reservoir. The track is single pin. It is held in place by cotter pins. And of course, you do have return rotors. We come around to the back of the tank now. This is the access port for that coil spring I mentioned for that last individual road wheel for lubrication purposes. While I mentioned the road wheel, uh, a little unique feature on this tank, most tanks, the tracks will have guide horns or center guides to keep the wheels in the track. Uh, not so with this one. The wheels themselves have flanges, and you can see one similar on the return roller here. So in this case, the wheels mesh into the track instead of, shall we say, the other way around. I just move a little bit further back behind the very tight mud scraper here, the large sprocket wheel. Now, two types of sprocket wheel were available depending on what type of track you had. The first 50 tanks came with a short pitch track. There were 144 links per side, and each link was 75 millimeters long. The later model, in the, the main production model, was 103 links per side, each of which was 105 millimeters in pitch. There was one additional change planned for the running gear of the tank, and that was to raise the idler at the front up a little bit. It was a little bit too low for good obstacle clearance. Last thing I'll mention while I'm kneeling down here is marker light at the rear. And one of the easiest visual distinguishers between the first 50 vehicles and the main production batch is the side. The first 50 did not have these two hatches on the side. What they had instead were more grills. Now, this was actually not a very convenient vehicle to maintain. Even the later versions, in order to move out the engine, you still had to unbolt the entire rear half of the tank uh, from both the bottom and the front. Still, things were improved. Initially, it took about 23 hours of work, all told, not man hours, to change out an engine on the first tanks uh, that were made. However, the later versions managed to get this number down to about 13. So opening up the hatches, immediately behind the firewall, you're going to see the engine. The engine is a 190 horsepower V8, and it will get the tank to a sustained speed of about 35 kilometers an hour and a burst speed of about 41. Now, one of the problems that we have, though, it's a little bit inconvenient even to access these hatches, is that in order to open this door, now we've taken advantage of the fact that the retaining clip has rusted in place. Ordinarily, you would spin the turret, open up this top hatch here, reach down, there's a handle, you'll pull that uh, forwards, it releases the latch, you can then open up this door. Then you reach around to the back, there is another handle in here, which releases the rear hatch. which is not light, I should add. Now inside here, you're gonna see the duct for the intake for the radiator system, which is on the far side. And at the back, what looks like a, uh, a drum brake uh, is actually part of the gearbox system. At the back of the tank, you can see the twin exhausts which come down and are then deflected off to the left, presumably so somebody can stand behind here, use the tank as cover without being poisoned. You can see the size of the bolts very easily back here. These are, of course, the ones that are holding the top half of the tank to the bottom half of the tank. A couple more tow clevises and a large tow hook for a trailer. I will come back to momentarily. Finally, of course, the wonderful Samoir badge. Uh, a little extra point to note here, these little access ports, if you look on the inside of the tank, I actually can't see what they're supposed to access. Perhaps there was something there originally, it's not there now. If you open the right-hand side of the tank, you see the large space for the cooling air for the radiator, and a little bit forward, you're gonna see the fuel tank. Well, technically there were two fuel tanks, although there's only one filler port just up here. 
One fuel tank was 100 liters, the other was 410, and they were equipped with overfill valves for safety. Unfortunately, the crews that were being sent into battle with these brand new tanks that just showed up weren't really aware of the intricacies of the overfill valve, so they'd fill up the tank until it filled, and it turned out they were only filling the 100 liter tank. This meant that the tank suffered a reputation for being extremely short ranged when the tank ran out of fuel after only traveling about 40 kilometers. Now, in reality, the tank was rated to do about 230 kilometers on the road if you knew how to fill the 410 liter tank in addition to the 100. Now, the French also wanted to have the cavalry units to be a little bit self-sufficient logistically. So to do this, they developed the Lorraine 37L. Most people will call it the Lorraine Schlepper, which was the name that the Germans gave the vehicle. It will carry some ammunition on itself, and then it would have a tracked trailer carrying about 565 liters of fuel. Unfortunately, although they were supposed to be on issue of three Lorraines per cavalry squadron of 20 tanks, just like the tanks, the deliveries of the Lorraines never met the requirements. So as a result, it would not be incredibly unusual to find some of the trailers being towed on the tow pindle that I mentioned earlier behind the Sommoir tank. Moving a little bit forward, on the right hand side you can see there is no access hatch. Instead what you have are these stowage rails, and you can do a couple of things. One is you could simply strap your backpack to it, or more commonly you would see one or perhaps more of these side panniers, which are very simply attached by hooking onto the side. And that brings us to the end of the tour of the exterior of the S35. And we'll be back of course in part two to have a look inside. See you then. The contract was given to the Société d'Utilage de Mécanique et d'Usinage d'Artillerie. To the Société d'Utilage... Uh, no, damn it. The Société d'Utilage de Mécanique... Uh, it could be worse, it could be Selbstfeuerlefet. Selbst <laughs>